to the day. Yeah. Very short. Half an hour is still still like 12 hours, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you did pretty well, really. Now we went out on the Friday night. Yeah, okay. Is that the one where you arranged the transport for us? No, that was that was just not. Right. Let's start Left then. Yes, oh. there's a few people on here, yeah, completely worse, but they're just on their way. So, this is the fifth hour of this introductory bit. And here's just what we've done so far, just to remind you the context of everything. So, in introduction, we looked at the basics of synchrotron, uh, a pendulum, Newton and Hamilton, all this kind of stuff. Now, that's like the underpinning stuff, also being rigidity, which is a very important concept of normalizing our equation. Then we derive Hill's equations, um, linearize them, so linear equations, and solve them using a matrix approach, the use of linear algebra to analyze some systems. And that was all done on a particle by particle basis, so a matrix acts on the vector x, x prime position at the other one part. Then, then in part three, it's quite fast these parts, it's part three. We then look at more of a zoomed out approach to current Snyder formalism, going to alpha, beta, and gamma, the lattice functions, and solving Hill's equations with that, uh, the ansatz of current and Snyder. We look at how to transform the lattice functions, which is stability, the requirement on the trace on the transfer matrix, the one term now. And then we looked at tube. Then we did some optics and lattice design, but then the, the basic structure we have is the photo cell. Uh, where we studied its properties, or um, uh, when it's stable and such things, and also mini beta installations. We have to stop there, because to study more complicated about the structures, we need to know about dispersion and bending, which is a topic of what we're going to discuss today. And then we looked, uh, it was three weeks ago now, I think, on uh, what happens in real life when we have errors in our lattice, field errors. Uh, we looked at what happens to the orbit, closed orbit distortion, and we looked at extra quadrupole errors giving us a tune shift in the lattice and we derive an expression to that based on the one cell map uh, right at the end. So that was three bits left, really two bits left, because eight will be just reading, you know, and I'll give you the slides, tell you what textbooks to look at, or signal radiation and damping effects. So the two bits we have to look at are a big the biggest bit is what are called real particles, but the ideas of dispersion, mental compaction, chromatistine emittance. So when we have particles that aren't quite the reference dimensor, which is all particles virtually, when we have orbit shifts, we have tune shifts, we have opportunal effects, so we'll look at that. Then we'll have a few slides on emittance, which is how we describe bunches of particles. And that'll probably take all of this um, slot, and then half, maybe a third or so, like a lack of coffee. Then we'll go on, on, on to the next topic, which is debatable whether you should include it in this kind of lecture course where that Graham should talk about. It's kind of the interface between this and the next uh, set of lectures by Graham Burt on RF and longitudinal. But it's looking at what happens in RF cavities from a dynamics point of view. So as a dynamicist, not an RF engineer. So we'll look at uh, what's called principle of phase stability. We'll look at real cavities. And we'll look at buckets and bunches. And we'll derive some equations of constellations in the longitudinal direction and moving around phase space in a slow way many turns of any of gravity. And there's a radiation effect which will be directed at. So here we have <coughs> dispersion, chromaticity, and emittance, which are very sort of fundamental things. And so what we do is we do a bit of maths, we have to do, right, it's a quantitative subject, but we'll also try and have lots of physical understanding as well. There are derivations in here, we'll go through them, but they're more for reference, if you guess, what you care about often is just the basic results. So this is a slide, this is not a new slide, this is a slide you saw about four weeks ago, uh, where we derived Hill's equations. And I've just put it in to remind you we did it, so when I, on the next slide, when I modify it, you believe us that we actually did it. You just remember, and if you look at this equation here, we derived this equation based on uh, the forces seen in the big field, part of the line in a circle. We then made a switch from time to space, which is what generated factors like this and this, and by is the uh, the field seen by the beam. Now what we then did, we then uh, Taylor expanded all the functions in this expression to get it linear in x, essentially. We did that, we got a linear equation of motion. We're about to do this again, but what we're going to do is we're going to make an expansion not only in x, but also in the momentum p. And we'll, and we'll keep terms not only linear in x, 
but linear in momentum deviation. That's good dispersion. Then we'll do it again in the second half of the lecture, and we'll keep a different set of terms. Terms proportional to momentum deviation and x, and that's what gives us our permittivity. So we've chucked away loads of physics by linearizing this equation, and we're going to restore some of it now by keeping additional terms and then seeing what happens to the resulting dynamics. So that's a slide that we saw last week, or whatever, four weeks ago. So this is the this is the first real slide. So up until this point, we've had some accelerator. You go off to design the first day at Darsbury. You have to, to design a storage range of 3 GeV electrons. That's your job. You know the rigidity of 3 GeV electron, so you know the strength of the bending fields, and everything's good, or our equations hold. But in reality, not all, most of our particles are not recorded on momentum particles. Our design momentum, they have a spread of momentum. And this is the first non true effect I have to worry about in particle dynamics. So the reference particle, or the reference particle, or the on momentum particle has some momentum, and in reality is a spread about this reference momentum. And that's what we have to consider for most of this lecture. Uh, so in general, what we do is we linearize our equations. We look at what happens to our equations for small values of momentum deviation delta P. That's a standard approach in most areas of physics. So in general, particles momenta will be the design momenta plus something small, some little ch shift around design momenta. So we have P plus delta P, where P is design momenta, is given by some shift delta P, or we can write that as 1 plus delta, where delta is defined as delta P over P. So that's our momentum shift. And, and what we're going to do is expand our equations linearly in this momentum shift delta. So they apply if delta is small, so your 3 GV on momentum, your 3.1 GV off momentum, that, that works. They go from 3 to 6 GV, our equation. Uh, won't work anymore. You have to retain higher order terms in delta. That's uh, not the topic for us today because we're interested in linear dynamics. So that's a different course in play. So what we're going to do is expand our momentum linearly. Then we're going to um, generally sometimes relate this to energy. So a different equation of the momentum. So that was derived hopefully in the, in the relativity course, uh, or you've seen it before. The delta E over E is beta squared, that's the normalized velocity times delta P over P. You haven't seen that before, just it's quite easy to derive all of the textbook. So, so what we're going to do? Well, we derived that equation before, our, tran our transverse equation of motion, where x is a transverse variable, rho is a bend radius, that's the field seen by the beam, and that's a natural longitudinal velocity. That's what that's as far as we got before. We're going to re-expand this. We're going to keep terms linear in x, but also in the variable delta, and just see what happens to our equations. That's what we can do. So we'll trivially rewrite this as this. That's, the, that's just one step. That's a bit of algebra. And we'll make an expansion of the right-hand side. So we'll make an expansion of the right-hand side, keeping terms only linear in x. 2x over rho, coming from the expansion of that, because we've got rho squared there. And we end up with something like this. So that's the new in x. We have to worry about the momentum. So where is the momentum? Well, the momentum's there. Mass times gamma times longitudinal velocity. That's momentum in physics. So what we do is we write our momentum as p into 1 plus delta. That's our approximation. But we then expand everything and keep terms only linear in x or linear in delta. Um, you can always go back and keep higher order terms if you want to, delta squares and x squares and such things, but the, 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 our approach of using matrices will no longer work. We have to have some other kind of machinery to, to handle the equations. So we expand the field as before. Uh, B, uh, the vertical field is some guide field times the gradient times the x, the horizontal distance. We have this term here, which is A over P is rigidity, 1 plus delta which we expand as just binomially as a over p into 1 minus delta. So we stick all this back in, we get this, we get this term, this term which we had before, then we've expanded the field, we've expanded delta, and we've expanded uh, the term proportional to x. We just do the same thing we did before, we just uh, look at what we have, we cancel off the 1 over rho because it's the guide field, all this kind of business, we drop terms, delta times x, for example, we drop 
because that's second order in our variables. We'll bring it back again later for chromaticity. And if you do all of this, you rederive some new equations of motion, which are like the second most simplest. The simplest we've done, right? Linear only in x. Now we've got the first correction to that, which is a linear only in delta. We'll have other ones later on, but this is like the next most complicated equation. And it looks like this in the horizontal plane. So it's now, that's the equation of motion. If that was delta was equal to naught, i.e. you were on momentum, you would just have that equal to naught, and we had what we had before, which we just go ahead and solve. The homogeneous version of the differential equation. Now we have an extra term on the right-hand side, which only depends on delta, and is delta divided by rho of n radians. So, so the right-hand side term is delta of a bend radius, which doesn't depend on x. So if you just cast your mind back to first year undergraduate physics or engineering, where you tackled uh, uh, differential equations, that's the inhomogeneous version of the homogeneous differential equation without equal zero. So in the language of differential equations, three, four weeks ago, whatever it was, we solved the homogeneous Hills equation equals no, no driving term, now we've got the inhomogeneous version, where we have a term on the right-hand side which doesn't depend on x. So we have to just go away and now solve this. So, the, so that we handle, at first order, the momentum spread of the beam. This, uh, 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 this will give us dispersion by adding a driving term to Hill's equations, which is inhomogeneous, which will generate what we call dispersion that we accelerate. So it's just the same. So that equals null we can solve. And if you remember how you solve these equations, you solve the homogeneous version first, then you go off and find the integral, which corresponds to the driving term, and you add the two things together. And that's just what we'll do. So this is just good basic differential equations. So now we see more structure to Hill's equations. Now it looks like this. I've just said all this, but we'll just go through it again. So now it looks like this, where we've got our left-hand side differential equation, the Hill's equations, now we have this extra delta bit. So it's homogeneous, apart from this term linear in delta, not in x. It will be extra terms in x later on today, but it's not just yet. So the extra term on the right-hand side, so this delta over rho, will drive the x motion for a horizontal, for an off-momentum particle. We'll call this additional x motion, off-momentum particle, dispersion. And note, there's no dispersion driving term in the vertical plane. If you do the analysis vertically, you won't get any dispersion in the vertical because it comes from actions when you have some kind of bend radius. Or in other words, if you're in a straight bit of accelerator, that's really large, so that old term is virtually 10 to zero. So there's no dispersion vertically. So you get a driving term in the, in the plane of the bend. So a general solution for this equation, for the horizontal motion, is given by the sum of two bits because it's an inhomogeneous second order differential equation. The Betatron motion term, which is what because up to this point, just think what happened. We had matrices, you had beta functions, you had oscillations. All this stuff is to do with the homogeneous version of the equation. And now we add to it an extra piece, which describes the motion, the additional motion we get from the, dri the driving term. So dispersion, when you hear about it, you know, you look at the talk, you see one plot the dispersion function. What they're plotting is the extra, is the shift in the motion of the normal betatron motion around some new uh, origin, if you like, which is just the effect of the dispersion. So the general solution is given by the sum of two bits. The Betatron motion term, which I call x of h, homogeneous, homogeneous Hill's equation, and we add to it an extra little bit, which arises from the solution of the driving term. It's just good old-fashioned, first year, second order, order differential equations we do. So the way I think of this physically, which is quite important, is that x sub i is a closed orbit term. So we have a shift of the closed orbit. So if there's no dispersion, everything's on momentum, we oscillate betatronically around the ideal orbit in the middle of all the magnets. That's what we had three weeks ago. In the presence of dispersion, the bit you oscillate around is simply shifted. So the dispersion is just a shift of what you oscillate the betatron oscillations around. That's the, that's the best way to think. So what we're going to do we're going to define a special orbit around the accelerator, big D, big D and S, the longitudinal distance. Now, this is the orbit 
followed by a particle with a momentum deviation delta equal to one. That you don't really have particles and accelerators that have a, that have a delta equal to one. So it's not that it's a fictitious orbit, but it lets us define that fact with the, uh, the dispersion function. So D of S, the, disp the dispersion function corresponds to the delta equal to one, or in other words, the dispersion function is this extra shift term I normalized to the momentum deviation. I, 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 you'll see in a sec what this means. So this is that's a formal definition of the dispersion function. So we've defined a new function called the dispersion. And you hear about this loads. If you last design every day, you'll worry about it. You go to any talk on a, on a synchrotron, we'll plot the dispersion. It's a very, very important function. And it's telling us how the orbit is shifted for off momentum particles. It's actually an orbit. It's, it's a physical mathematical orbit around the accelerator. You won't get particles on it, because if you're a delta equal to one, you won't be stored for very long in your accelerator. But it does exist as a mathematical orbit. It, it, it's valid. And if a particle had delta of one, it's, it's what its orbit would be. It's a, if it's an orbit, it's therefore fo focused by the lattice. So the, the dispersion function is focused by the lattice. It's very important. And the motion of our particle is the sum of our old x as a function of s, our oscillations, our beta tron oscillations, plus this extra dispersion function times delta. So the overall motion of a particle, position as a function of s, is no longer just the oscillatory beta tron term, there's also a shift, a shift of the middle bit of the oscillations, which is equal to the delta uh, dispersion multiplied by the momentum deviation. So that's the first order in the momentum deviation. So if, I, so if you were cleverer, you went back and retained terms in delta and delta cubed, so on, you can imagine you could write a, a whole expansion here in delta, plus d2 times delta squared, or something like this. And that's non-linear dispersion, that's way beyond our considerations today. So we're defining linear dispersion, which is the linear shift of the, of the particle's orbit, linear and delta, because that's what we're doing. So we view this equation as a dispersive term as a closed orbit around the machine, and the particles oscillate around the dispersive orbit with the usual beta tron oscillations. So that's what dispersion is. Dispersion is quite confusing, but just all we can back this basic definition, I will make clear. So it's like a dipole error closed orbit distortion. Remember, uh, uh, we had that equation three weeks ago for the orbit shift for a, a dipole error in the lattice, so we had some oscillation down the ring. It's a little bit like that. What, what are typical values of an accelerator? Typically, x beta is a handful of millimeters oscillating around the machine. The dispersion function tends to be the order of meters. If you look at some plots for a synchrotron, I'll show you some in a sec. The dispersion function is the order of meters, which means that if you were twice the design energy, you'd be offsetting the orbit by the order of a meter. Clearly, you'd hit the wall of the accelerator, because you don't have particles of this momentum deviation in an accelerator. Delta is typically 10 to the minus 3, so the dispersion function orbit shift is also the order of a meter. So everything kind of works out. But you'll see dispersion functions plotted roughly the order of a meter. So here's an exercise. It's quite a tough exercise, I would say, this one. So it makes a link between dispersion and our, uh, our closed orbit distortion due to a single dipole kick. So the question is, what would the new um, fringes of motion be in the presence of a field error, delta bx and delta by? So if you just add, so far we have some constant field plus a gradient times x. If we have an extra uh, field error, what would the equations of motion look like? You can then relate this to the equation we stated for the impact of the error around the ring. We can actually deduce an integral expression for a dispersion driven at the point s by some dipole of length l position s, s prime. And the hint is, it looks like pretty much exactly like our closed orbit distortion expression. You know, with causes of the phase, one over some kind of resonance term, all this kind of stuff is all there. And that's kind of a nice thing to do, because it links together closed orbit distortion to dispersion in a mathematical way. That's quite a hard one. So, so this is dispersion. So here is an accelerator, very idealized accelerator. Uh, so imagine you have some bend radius rho. The blue here corresponds to some reference trajectory, some ideal orbit. So what we've really done up until this point is we define some orbit in the accelerator, some closed orbit, 
which for all our analysis three weeks ago, just went to the middle of all of admin, the zero, zero point. We then looked at uh, beta functions, and we oscillate around this reference orbit. So our x is the variable going around this blue line to the accelerator, which is all well and good. Now we roll in dispersion. And what we find from dispersion is that this closed orbit is shifted. So the beta translations themselves are the same, they're just around a different line through the accelerator. That's what off-mentalness does to you in first order. So here we have our blue, beautiful, perfect central design orbit, which is closed with the momentum particle. We then think, what happens if we have some momentum particle? Well, for this case, we oscillate around the blue line and everything's wonderful. But if you have momentum behavior, you just shift this, this blue line shifts either to a line like that or to a line like that. These are closed orbits. If you're less than or greater than the design momentum, and you simply perform Beatrice oscillations around one of these two dotted lines. So dispersion is a shift of the reference trajectory of your Beatrice oscillations. That's what it is. It's telling you, if you have different parts of the momentum, how their orbits are different from each other. And the amount of the shift of this, of this orbit is just the dispersion function times delta P over P to first order. Right, so that's dispersion. That's hopefully get a physical idea of what dispersion is. It's quite confusing later on. But just remember, it's different orbits taken by part of a different momentum to the accelerator. That's what it is. So how do we calculate D of S? Um, well, we have to do a bit of work. It's not so much work, a small amount of work. It's, it's, it's fairly straightforward. So what we have to basically do is we have to find a solution to the inhomogeneous Hill's equation and add it to the general solution of the homogeneous equation. You should know that from differential equations. So if I'm faced with this differential equation, I know the right-hand side doesn't depend on x, the driving term. So I solve the equation, left-hand side equals naught, I go off and do it, and then add, add to that the linear an extra solution corresponding to the effect of the right-hand side. That's just what that's what we do. Fortunately, we've already solved the equation, uh, the homogeneous equation, where that's equal to naught. That's what we spent three weeks ago doing uh, in the presence of no momentum deviation. So we've done that. We've got causes and signs, cinches and coshes, matrices, oscillations, tune, all this kind of stuff. We've done that. Now we've got to solve, find the, uh, the uh, extra solution. We have to add it rising from this equation. So we do this by imagining there's no gradients and delta equals one. This means that the dispersion function is a solution of the resulting inhomogeneous equation. So we have no, it's like a no gradients, and we know dispersion function is, um, is delta equals to one. So we make that, we set that, so we have to solve this equation. That's the equation of Bayes by the dispersion function. So our procedure is simple. We make uh, the right hand, uh, uh, we solve the the left hand side equal to naught. Uh, well, we've done that because it's, it's the homogeneous equation. So the goal is to find a particular solution to this equation and add it to the solution to this equation. Uh, that's what I do. Uh, since, so, how do we find the solution to the inhomogeneous equation? This is the worst bit of work we have to do. Since, how do we find the solution to the inhomogeneous equation here? Well, again, what you do in differential equations, you can a particular integral, you look at the right-hand side driving term, you try a trial solution equal to the functional form of that, sub it in, and just see if that works. Perhaps you remember that from uh, residence theory and things like this. So what, what, so what we do is the right-hand side is a constant, so we guess that it could, we'll try a constant as a, as a solution to the inhomogeneous equation. So let us try a constant, let's call it C, so we stick this into the inhomogeneous equation and work out what the constant C actually is. Clearly, if we differentiate this, we get naught. So all we're left with is C over rho squared equals, sorry, C over rho squared equals 1 over rho squared. So the constant is just equal to rho. So we've done it, we've solved it. Easy. So the general solution to the dispersion function is simply the solution to this equation, and it's given by the homogeneous solution to that equation, which we know was just sines and cosines in a dipole, we've already solved that, that's our transfer map for a dipole, added 
which is a particular integral, but a particular differential equation, which we know is just a constant rho. So actually, it's quite, it's quite easy. It's quite straightforward. Now, uh, uh, we're getting to the bottom line in a second. So finally, we, uh, we have to simply determine the constants A and B. How do we find constants A and B? Well, we have some dipole. We have some non-zero rho. We have no gradients, so it's a dipole we're talking about. We just fix the initial conditions at the start of the dipole to be some dispersion. So we say at x equals naught, we have some dispersion, and we have some dispersion prime. We just don't know what it is. It's just, it's just about initial conditions. That's just a solution differential equation. We stick these guys into our solution. We find the constants are equal to d naught, the initial dispersion, minus rho. And B is equal to rho d naught prime. Just stick them in, you find it. That's the of algebra. Again, uh, we shouldn't worry too much about the details of the algebra. It's the physics we care about. And therefore, we can write the dispersion function as this. That's good. So what have we done? What have we achieved? Well, this says that if we have some region of accelerator, which has no gradients, and some rho, i.e. some bending radius, so it's a dipole, and we feed in, at the start of it, we have some dispersion, some dispersion prime, i.e. the orbit shift off many of the particles. This tells you the dispersion on the way out of the element. Um, and remember, it's a dipole. So there's two bits of this equation. The first bit is that the dispersion that comes out through the dispersion of x and the dispersion prime of s is the dispersion speeded in with the impact of what look like sines and cosines. Now, that's actually just the focusing matrix for a dipole. Remember we said the dispersion is just an orbit. So if the dispersion goes into a dipole, it gets focused by the dipole. So if the dispersion goes into a quadrupole, it gets focused by the quadrupole, and so on and so forth. But also, an extra bit, there's these two guys here. So even if d naught and d naught prime were equal to zero, we had zero dispersion, so all particles of different momenta have the same central orbit, after the dipole, they wouldn't, because we'd have generated additional dispersion, additional contribution to d and ds and d prime, because we're in the region of the dipole. So two things have happened. We have a dipole. This bit says if we feed in existing dispersion as we hit the dipole, it gets focused by the dipole. And the dipole will generate additional dispersion. Remember what D is, is how different parts of the have different orbits. So a dipole will generate separation of orbits for different parts of the That's all D, D of S is. So that's good. That's what dispersion is. So that's been quite good. It means that we straight away actually know what happens to the dispersion in a quadrupole because our analysis has said that we know a dipole focuses from weak focusing for geometrical effect and this focuses the dispersion. Therefore, in a quadrupole, these guys here will just become the quadrupole focusing matrix. So dispersion is also focused in a quadrupole by the same matrix as the normal particle is. It's just, it's just an orbit. It's like a made-up particle with two, which is totally off momentum by 100%. Now, we can be a bit clever here. We're like, um, some books don't do this, but I think it's quite neat, where we found that the solution to the homogeneous Hills equations was linear. You could use matrices. You can actually cast this result into a matrix equation to understand how this vector, d, d0 prime, and 1, evolves as you move through the accelerator by a little trick, by writing down a vector, d0, d0 prime, and a third element equal to 1, this is an acted upon by three by three matrix of these elements. And if you multiply this out, you see you generate the right terms, where the, the top left bit, the top two by two bit, is just a focusing matrix of that element acting on D nor D nor prime. And then this extra column here is tells you about the generation or creation of new dispersion by that element, which just corresponds to this element and, uh, and this element here. Because this bit, this bit would multiply with this one, so just end up with a constant shift. So that's quite neat. You can write down a matrix for an element that tells you what happens to dispersion, even the generation of dispersion. That's quite cool. So the upper left two by two matrix is just a translator for a dipole. 
the one we derived that, it means the dispersion function of Bayes of matrix equation already derived. It's just an orbit. Dispersion is just an orbit. We know how an, how a particle moves through an accelerator by its matrices, so we know how the dispersion involves. But also, we've seen that we have the additional terms that are driven in a dipole. So we create new dispersion in a dipole. So you stick a beam into a dipole, you come out with additional beam dispersion. Or a dipole sorts particles of different momentum in an ordered way according to their orbits. That's what dipoles do. We say it's produced or we say it's driven because of the, the driving term in the inhomogeneous balls of wave. What this all means is that the dispersion function, the special orbit obeyed by delta equals one particles, which tells about the orbit shift of the beam, and this function in a quadrupole obeys the quadrupole transfer matrix. If you go ahead and solve Hill's equations in a, a, in a for, for, um, for the orbit d in a quadrupole, you'll find it just obeys the normal quadrupole transfer matrix with no additional driving terms. So the dispersion function is focused in a quadrupole. So the dispersion function in a lattice is focused by uh, by um, a focusing element of quadrupole. However, quadrupoles don't generate extra dispersion because rho is infinite, so that the, the driving term is gone away. So finally, the motion of the particle is given by two contributions. This bit we nailed three weeks ago, the Betatron term, and now we have a shift to this, which depends on delta, given by the product of the <laughs> function. So that's what, that's what, so the first impact of having particles with different momentums in the beam is, is the, the simplest thing is we have our old, our all the same momentum motion, we have a shift of the orbit according to delta. You might say, well, hang on, surely as well, the, oscill the oscillatory bit will be affected by different delta p of p as well, won't it? And you're absolutely right, that's the next effect to look at. So, what we're going to do is we're going to sort the effects in terms of complexity. We've retained only terms looking like delta in Hill's equations, we get an orbit shift. Later on, we'll retain a, a term looking like delta times by x, and we'll find we get also a perturbation to this term. But that doesn't exist yet. So we have our ideal on momentum beta to oscillations around a new reference digit. So that, that's the solution. So also you can write the general motion for x and x prime as a matrix equation. So again, we're doing this trick of three by three matrices. Some books would use five by five for the horizontal vertical plane plus the dispersion bit. Um, okay, it's quite a useful uh, mathematical trick, I think, where we can define some new, some vector corresponding to a particle x naught x naught prime and delta going into a magnet where delta is a constant. We then have the standard transfer matrix and we have the dispersion driving terms in that element, and then we come out with the information. So that's just a useful trick you see sometimes in books. So our subject is all about a lot of times little tricks with matrices. So dispersion in a short dipole and the quadrupole, well, are there useful expressions you could do in the pub to calculate dispersion? So you go to the pub afterwards when they compute the dispersion in your storage ring. Can you do it by hand in the pub? Well, you can. If you just, in a standard dipole, you have short sector dipoles where this quantity is very small. You can then write down the, um, the simplified transfer map of, the, of that element. Notice that's just a drift, and um, these are the approximations of the dispersion driving terms. So we have these. So these act on that vector that we saw before, and I had a quick calculations, and this corresponds to a thin lens kick for an optimum. Uh, a quadrupole has no driving term for the dispersion, so the, th the three by three map, or the matrix, the linear map, is given by this. But that's the standard quadrupole matrix, and that's just zero, zero, one. So the zero, zero here means the quadrupoles don't drive dispersion, it's only dipoles. So in heavy weather, you could argue, of the first possible off-momentum correction to our basic equations, where we just have terms linear and delta, and we see an orbit shift. But, but, but that's because it's the first time things have been off-momentum, so be very careful in how, in how we treat it. So dispersion in a photo cell. So if you go to any accelerated meeting about lattices, the plot dispersions. So it's important to get a feeling for what these, uh, this function will tend to do. Consider a photo cell with uh, some thin lens quadrupoles. I imagine we have a photo cell that looks like this. So it's photo in the sense where the O's aren't drifts anymore. The, the O's are now bends. 
so we have a focusing quadrupole or half of one, but just like last time, because we're going to have a symmetry point for our calculation of the quantities. We have some bend, we have some defocusing quad, we have the same bend, we have half the focusing quad again. So it's like it's the one cell map for this photo structure, but we're, bend, we're bending now. Previously, the O's were drifts three weeks ago, and so there's no dispersion driven. But now we've swapped the O's for bends, dipoles, and we know that in dipoles we generate dispersion. We sort orbits according to their momentum. So we know we're going to have some noise of dispersion in the structure. Jim, what we did last time, we, uh, for a photo cell for Vitatron motion, we constructed the one cell map and extracted all the information from that, the beta functions, the tunes, all that kind of stuff. So we just do that again. But this time, we use these three by three matrices where the two by two bits are just the standard Betatron bits, and we have this extra third column corresponding to the, uh, the uh, dispersion driving terms, where there's none in the quadrupole, there's none in the drift, but there is driving terms for dispersion in the uh, dipole. No, notice now, if I generate some dispersion here, I'm going to focus it by these guys. So as soon as, as soon as dispersion is generated, it gets focused by the lattice straight away. That's important, as we'll see, for controlling dispersion. So how do, we, how do we find the motion of this? Well, we find the one turn map, the one cell map. We times all these guys together, and we get the map through one cell of the photo cell, which has quadrupoles and dipoles in it. If you, and if you do the maths in Mathematica, or whatever, it looks like that. So that bit there is actually one that we've seen before. That's just the two by two, the Betatron map of our photo cell. Um, and this bit here is the extra terms arriving from the dispersion, where L is the dipole length, B is the bend angle, and F is the quadrupole focusing uh, focal length. So F appears there, F appears there, minus the X is focusing, plus the X is defocusing, and a half and a half because that's half the map at each end of the cell, so it's closely, so it's a symmetry point. So, but now we have info on the dispersion generated by the photo cell. So, because it's periodic, imagine it's a periodic system, the dispersion at QF, the start and the end point, must satisfy what's called in uh, B physics the closed orbit condition. Closed orbit condition is everything's nicely periodic. So a closed orbit condition for a particle, x is equal to x at the start and the end, x prime equals the same at the start and the end. Here we have the closed orbit condition for the dispersion, which says I have subdispersion at the start, I then have the map for the structure, and I get the same thing at the end. So my dispersion is periodic. So I'm looking at the periodic dispersion. If I then solve this equation to extract the what dispersion is periodic through that structure, solve this equation, and I'm, I'm noting that, which we found when we studied the um, photo cell, I can calculate the periodic dispersion I would get in my photo cell in the middle of the equator. And if I do it, I get that, which is a very memorable expression, for the dispersion in the middle of the F quad. Uh, and, the, and the gradient of that, of that dispersion is simply zero. So the sum dispersion is periodic in the middle of the F quad. And because it's periodic, that means if it's turning around in the F quad, that means that the gradient is zero. So I get the dispersion anywhere else by transforming this vector using our three by three maps we just derived, and I just find that in the middle of the M, the D quad, I can find this dispersion. So the point is we can calculate dispersion using our matrices. You won't get all the subtleties by just looking at these few slides. You have to, you have to, you have to do it, right? But you can see that you can do it if you wanted to extract the dispersion. So what does dispersion look like? Well, here is back to our old favourite, the LHC arc cell, the 110 metre long photo cell in the LHC, where we've plotted the beta functions, and we understand beta functions now, because we've studied them three weeks ago. We know it describes the focusing, the beta turn oscillations. Black is a horizontal beta function, peaking in the F quad, as we found three weeks ago. Red is the vertical beta function, peaking in the vertical focusing quad, as we found a few weeks ago. And also we can see we have this new function, the dispersion function. Again, it oscillates, as we know it should, and if we calculate it according to the things we've just done, we see it has the same 
frequency and oscillation as the beta function, and actually the horizontal uh, dispersion peaks in the same place as the vertical beta function. This beta function oscillates through the lattice. And when I think about that, um, okay, what does that tell me? Well, the beta function is telling me the, uh, about the strength of the oscillations, and, and the green line, the dispersion, is telling me how different particles of momentum are sorted as they move the accelerant. So we can see it oscillates like this. So typical values, beta functions here, that's 30, 20 meters, that's 200 meters, and the dispersion function goes from zero to two. So the dispersion function oscillates between about uh, uh, one, sorry, that's, that, that's 0.9, so that's one meter, and that's two meters. So that's typical values for the dispersion. I mean, and, and if you know these dipole parameters, and these quadruple focal lengths, you calculate this uh, this plot very easily. In fact, if you look at this, this is, this is done with MAD. Some of you may know, uh, may have used MAD for doing optics already. That's a MAD plot. All MAD does for the dispersion is the equation I've just looked at. So it just takes your, your dipole strength, your quadrupole strength, it computes these matrices, and it extracts the dispersion now. So if you run MAD, you're just essentially doing what we just did, but the second fast forward. What about a different code? Well, this is an example. Well, this, is, this is actually um, a code. This is Hera. So this is the, e, um, the machine in DESI that's now closed down. Here we have, at the top, we have the beta functions. Here's the interaction point, so beta x and beta y. And here, in, in the bottom, we have the dispersion in Hera, where red is horizontal and blue is vertical. So you can see and the left is the interaction point, so we have zero dispersion where the beams collide because we're going to maximize the luminosity, so we just spread the beam out. But then we soon go into the arcs of Hera, we have lots of dipoles, and we start to see the characteristic oscillation of the dispersion as it goes through the dipoles. Note for the and note the dispersion is positive in the rings, this matters later for us. Um, yes, yeah, so that's Hera again, so uh, quite a nice plot. In a, in a German optics code, it's quite hard to decode sometimes. Um, what about the LHC? Well, here's dispersion around Atlas. So this is the, op this is the optics of the Large Hadron Collider. We've looked at this plot before uh, when we look when we study the beta functions. Let's look at it again and see the dispersion. So again, this is MAD, so it's help helpfully plotted for us different beam elements above there. These guys here are dipoles. The little rectangles above the line are horizontal focus and quadrupoles, and vice versa for little um, triangles below, uh, uh, rectangles below the line. This is a function of s. Um, uh, blue is horizontal beta function, y is vertical. You can see it's in the arc in the photo cell, so it's oscillating nicely. We then have a bunch of magnets that transform it down to a minima to do the beam collisions. We understand now why this beta function gets so big. It's a mini beta principle, and we talked about that um, three weeks ago, so it gets very large. Um, it's very small there, and it gets matched by the quadrupoles going into the arc. But now we have the dispersion. So we can see the dispersion is that zero, so the dispersion is matched to be zero horizontally at the IP where the beams collide to maximize the luminosity. So that's a boundary condition. It's then periodic in the arcs. And we use the quadrupoles in this region not only to focus the beta function to the right point, but also as we can focus dispersion, we focus the dispersion function as well to, to, to convert it from the periodic arc to zero at the interaction point. You may think in a slightly curious feature, and a slightly curious feature is that we have the, the beta functions here. So that, and now oscillatory and periodic, so that's where the arc of the LHC instead of photo cells have started. But the beta, uh, the dispersion seems to have not quite perfect neat oscillations yet. It's like slightly, it's rising and rising and rising. It starts to be periodic here, and I think, well, why is that? Well, the reason is, I don't know if time to discuss it, but in the arc of the LHC, in a photo cell, you always get um, oscillatory dispersion going up and down. You want to make it zero here by construction of the lattice to, to maximize collisions. So you have to get rid of it. You have to eliminate dispersion. So what we do is we use a scheme where we reduce the bending in these cells. If you notice, we're missing a dipole there. There's a gap there. And that's called the dispersion suppressor, where you can, the office can be constructed to bring the dispersion down in stages 
two oscillate around zero for the interaction point. So that's all part of the optics of the LHC. And when you do optics, you would tend to dis design this region first, the, the really strong quads that bring the mini beta principle uh, down towards the interaction point. You would then design your arc, you would then stick in extra quads, these guys here, Q4 to Q7, we call them in LHC terminology. You then adjust these quadrupoles to match the beta and match the dispersion at the interaction point. That's what, and that's called optics matching. And people upstairs will be swearing at their computers day after day after day, after day trying to get good matches for these functions by adjusting the quadrupoles. And you can see, you get back into the arc again. Then you have to design your dispersion suppressor with missing then to bring the dispersion down. So there's quite a lot of action going on in that plot. And that's several PhDs worth of optics action to get at that uh, beautifully designed system. So what about injection? Well, okay, so this is the LHC arc in injection. And I've, uh, and I've put this just to show that you can you get oscillatory functions. So here we have the mean size, or, or, or the beta function rather, blue is x and red is y. Always in the LHC we have these colors. And we see the oscillatory beta function. And we see here, the corresponding oscillatory dispersion, horizontal dispersion. So the peak of horizontal dispersion corresponds to a peak in the horizontal beta function, which is in the middle of the focusing, horizontal focusing quadruple. So dispersion is a very good thing. Typical numbers, betas in a ring like this, um, 100 meters or so. Typical length of deviation, 10 to the minus 4 for the LHC. Uh, dispersion max is about 2 meters. So they're typical numbers that you get. So, we, so this plot is telling you how particles of different momenta have different offset orbits. That's what this version is telling you. So you remember one thing, remember that. Right, lattice building blocks. Let's do some more lattice design in the last few minutes before coffee. So we know about quadrupoles, we know about dispersion, and we've studied the photo cell, which is our simple basic structure, alternating quadrupoles to build a beam transport line and build an arc. It's not so simple. Most synchrotrons in the LHC built out of the photo cell, so um, it's, it's good quality physics. But it's an example of a basic optical building block we use to construct lattices. I'm not entirely to tell you about them all, but I can tell you about roughly what goes on. So you can imagine many possible configurations of dipoles and quadrupoles that give you stable motion, for example, a photo cell. But then we've studied that for transport to beam. Also, we talk about dispersion-free lattices, which are important in many applications. Basically, what we want to do is, can you bend the beam without generating dispersion? Because we know a dipole generates dispersion. We don't want dispersion a lot of the time. We don't want it at interaction points. We don't want it where we have cavities, so on. So dispersion can be a bad thing. So can we bend the beam without generating dispersion? Yes, we can. I'll show you a couple in a sec. Examples are Chastman Green uh, insertions, triple bend acromats. Also, we can build dispersion suppressors, which I told you about for the LHC which match periodic dispersion in arc, that's made of photo cells, into a dispersion free straight. I won't have time to talk about that. If you Google it, you'll find loads of stuff about it. You can also displace a beam transversely without generating dispersion, for example, if they do diagnostics. Sometimes you call this a geometrical acromat. So acromat's quite a useful and very good thing. So let's talk about it. A lot of words on this slide, but Basically, the point of an acromat is self-cancelling dispersion. <coughs> if the dispersion function is non-zero, the orbit of particles depend the orbit of particles depends on momentum. Where they, the middle of their orbit in in the structure depends on what momentum they have. That's what dispersion is. This is an um, acromatic means we design it. So